used to doing serious talks. Um, I, I make a living out of not being serious, but um, I take my career very seriously. I have been pounding the streets for 17 years as a stand-up comedian. And it's, um, it's a job that I dreamed of doing as a child, but it was as, as realistic as saying, oh, I want to go and live on the moon. It didn't seem like a, like a realistic career at all. But I'm so glad that I was able to find a way into it and, and make it work for me so far. You never know, showbiz. Um, because I always felt like a misfit. I always felt like an outsider. Um, now, but my job gives me an identity that I feel so comfortable with. Um, now, what do I mean when I say outsider? It's not a, it's not a willful state of being. Human uh, beings need to feel like they belong. And I never really felt like I did. If I, if I'm, um, if I just talk personally, socially, I found things extremely difficult whenever I was at school. Um, I, I remember not being able to speak English. I moved to Britain when I was four and a half, and I thought English was a series of sounds that people made up and other people magically understood, and yet they didn't understand when I went up and spoke gobbledygook, um, which was my favorite word in the English language. <laughs> that and haberdashery. <laughs> that... that that feeling of um, not having a tribe was very potent in my life um, at school. Uh, when I did jobs, post-graduation, call centre work, I found it baffling how other people would find it so easy to find a companion for lunch. Um, whereas I found that the idea of asking a casual acquaintance if they'd like to have lunch with me... Um, the same as sort of asking them to marry me. It was, it was as awkward. Um, when I was about 16 or 17, I was at a dinner when I didn't know anyone. The one person I knew was at the other end of the table, and they uh, were university students, slightly older than me, and I was trying to hold my own, but I couldn't be heard. And I, I remember that profound feeling of almost crippling shyness. I couldn't open my mouth to speak. If someone spoke to me, I would, nothing would come out. Um, I felt like I was underwater and everybody else was on the surface and I had to leave dinner early because um, not deliberately, just, the, just tears came from my face from shyness and my face was burning and I was thankful that I am Middle Eastern. No one noticed the hotness of my face as visibly as they might have done otherwise. And everyone thought I was pretty strange. Um, everyone else at that dinner went on to have, you know, fruitful lives, I imagine. I mean, I, I never really um, saw any of them on the comedy circuit. Um, <laughs> but it's a, it's a very painful place to be when your world is a different shape to everybody else's. And I think that's why I love stand-up, why, why, why a job where I'm making something out of nothing works for me, because then I'm creating my own world. And I'm inviting people to come into that, because I understand my world. So I want to invite people to come into mine and, and help, hopefully make them understand uh, my world. And sometimes it goes horribly wrong. <laughs> the experience of walking off a stage to the sound of your own footsteps. Um, <laughs> My favourite outsider is Holden Caulfield, the catcher in the rye. Um, he says, everybody sticks together in these dirty goddamn cliques. The guys that are on the basketball team stick together. The Catholics stick together. The goddamn intellectuals stick together. The guys that play bridge stick together. Even the guys that belong to the goddamn Book of the Month club stick together. And I got Holden. I really did, because I didn't know how to be in a clique. If I ever was, briefly, it was only ever as a tourist, never a native. I would be with the clubbers. I'd be with the bookworms. Um, I even joined the gay society at university um, without being gay. Um, <laughs> because they looked like they had fun. <laughs> I mentioned the word native. I think that's a, quite a crucial thing in, in my experience. I, I wasn't born in Britain. I was born in Iran. We came here as... Um, well, we, we got refugee status in Britain uh, in 
by, I think, by 1986, our papers came through, and we were naturalised. So I was then natural. Before that, I was officially an alien. And the reason um, we came over was because my father goes against the grain. He is, my father is the, the satirist Hadi Korsandi, and he was outlawed by the regime in Iran for um, opposing it. And we moved to Britain. And a profound experience that we had in Britain was, and this was not unique to our family, I have to stress that, was that we became targets abroad of terrorism endorsed by the um, Republic, Islamic Republic of Iran. And in 1984, Scotland Yard, Scotland Yard uncovered a plot to assassinate my father in London. Now, telling people that now, uh, even now, makes me feel like that weird kid at school who comes in saying, yeah, my granddad lives in space. Um, it just seems like a bizarre thing. But it was very real to us, and we had to go into hiding for a few days. And when I was researching my book, I went to The Hague, where there was a trial, and some evidence of my father's would-be assassins came to light. And in court, they were described as a fat man and a very fat man. <laughs> which upset my father, because if you're going to be assassinated, you want some slick Alan Rickman type <laughs> to do it, not Tweedledum and Tweedledee huffing and puffing to the getaway car. <laughs> I found um, a transcript of my father's death order, and it was signed by none other than the Ayatollah Khomeini himself. And on it was written, the writer, Hadi Korsandi, is to be shot as he takes his children to school. And in bold, uh, there was, it was written, the children are not to be harmed. Now, that was amazing, because I'd written the Ayatollah a letter. When I was 11, I'd, I'd written to him and I'd said, we're getting death threats at home, please don't kill my dad. Why don't you come to London to meet him? He's very nice and he makes jokes off about everybody, even me. Our address is 65A <laughs> Maidley Road. Now, he never wrote back, but when I saw that they'd said the children are not to be harmed, I thought, oh, <laughs> he got my letter. <laughs> Now, after this incident, my parents said, you are not to tell anybody at school what's happened. I was like, why? Is it classified information? Are we still in danger? And they said, no, 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 they'll just think you're odd. And that's the, the feeling that we grew up with. We were just a little bit odd with all this stuff going out on at home, not to mention the fact that we didn't have cheese sandwiches. We had, like, cotlet, this bizarre green stuff coming out of pita bread for our pat lunches. Um, so... Much of my life, growing up, feeling like an outsider, I, I spent in a state of bewilderment. And yes, culturally things affect you. Racism, of course, affected me as a child. It, it is a, a few things make you feel more of an outsider than when you're a little kid, maybe five or six years old. And I remember a car load of uh, people, I think they're called, um, actually slowed their car down, adults, to shout to my mum and I, a young woman with a five-year-old daughter, me, go home, go home. And I tugged on my mum's sleeve going, mummy, tell them we're going home. We only live up the hill. <laughs> and I realised realized that they, they were being hostile towards me. Rental ads for house shares alienate us. Um, I would read them and people would be stipulating professionals only. This is in my 20s and I was trying to make my mark in London, scuttling around on the comedy circuit trying to get five minute gigs here and there. Um, professionals only is just a bit more PC saying no than, than saying no chavs. But the message is clear. Uh, no riffraff and no DSS, which was a problem for me because I think I was riffraff and DHS. Um, I found these ads very intimidating when I was looking for a place to live. Um, in the end, to fund my, my years as, um, as a fledgling stand-up comedian, uh, and also when I was a student as well, I worked as a cleaner in an old people's home, and it was a time in my life when I felt like I truly belonged. Um, I was doing something good. I was hanging out with humans. I was serving humans. I was not the object-driven, time-poor corporate wage unit that my jobs in call centers subsequently tried to fit me into, and I couldn't. And what I found with working on the comedy clubs, even though I was getting very little money, what it meant was I had the freedom to be vulnerable. I had the freedom to be myself. I had the freedom to fall flat on my face and it not working and having no one to answer to but myself um, and the odd club owner. 
Uh, I recently, perhaps unwisely, got into a row with neo-fascists on Twitter. Um, I spend a lot of time on Twitter, and I do get trolled. And if I get trolled, people say to me, the only reason you've got a career is because you're a woman and from Iran. Why, yes. Yes. As everyone knows, these are the two key things <laughs> that one needs for a successful career in show business. In fact, my mother has just been booked for Live at the Apollo. <laughs> at least these guys on Twitter were honest with me. They were honest by, by shouting at me and saying that you're an outsider. Usually, what we're faced with is a reactionary columnist on a tabloid who will go to pains to deny being racist. One of the accomplishments of the right-wing opinion formers is to assume the stance of an outsider while actually being eminently conformist, working for the man. The hippie in me will never die. Some of these columnists write as though being white and being privileged and working for a right-wing newspaper for an awful lot of money works against you. They talk about this as though it's a disability. The function of the right-wing columnist is to contest the outsider status of the vulnerable. Because if the true extent of their plight is expressed, it can cause political problems for those leaders who they serve to protect. They are there to protect capitalism. They're there to protect capitalism from the accusation that it's unjust and that it leaves people behind. When you are a vulnerable person, when you're a vulnerable outsider, now you have a fight on your hands against the blinkered worldview of the hard done by right-wing columnists that try and sell us this idea that the dominant culture is being threatened by these pesky minorities, whereas actually the feeling of being an outsider is a human thing. We all experience it at various times in our lives, uh, or, or, or perhaps perpetually. It really has nothing to do with who lives next door to us, or how many refugees are around us, or whether or not they go to, to school with our children. Um, this disconnect that, that we have with our actual selves is, is something that that worries me about our, our society. And, and, but the good thing is that, that, that things like yoga exist now uh, for everybody in psychotherapy. Um, these, these, these things exist because so many of us feel an outsider to ourselves, to the person that we are at work. And again, one of the freedoms of, me, of being a comedian is that I feel able to say, my life is baffling. The world is baffling, I feel terrible, and I have no idea what I'm doing. Isn't that a wonderful place to be? And because as a stand-up comedian, it doesn't matter who is in the audience. It could be a neo-Nazi, it could be E.T., it could be someone that on paper I will have nothing in common with, but I have an insatiable desire to communicate with people who aren't necessarily um, on paper the same as me because I like to find that common ground. And when I find that common ground, when I find that it works and I make that connection because my job is a conversation, if I speak and you laugh, that's a conversation. If I'm able to do that, it makes me feel alive and it makes me feel human and it makes me feel that I've created a world where I invite people to share their spirit with me for however long um, that, that may be. And it makes me feel like I'm the cool kid in the playground at last. Um, and finally, I want to mention that um, uh, as an adult, one of the things that I had to overcome feeling an outsider about was being a single mother. Um, I, I have two children with two different fathers, and I'm not with either father. Don't judge me. And... <laughs> And no matter how lion-hearted you try to be as a single parent, there is an, a, a guilt, if I may call it a guilt, uh, that rugby tackles me to the ground when I least expect it. I was in the park with my two children actually not that long ago, and I saw another family who, unlike my exes and I, had made it. A mum and dad and their three beautiful children playing together in the Sunday sunshine. And I looked at that family, and I was so happy for them. Um, they were beautiful, and I looked at that mum and dad, and I thought... You two saw the bigger picture. You two knew that raising this family together and keeping this unit tight like this was more important than either of your personal happiness. And I was happy for this family, but I felt a guilt that I haven't created and maintained that for my own children. Um, 
They, they were geese. They, they were... <laughs> With that, I leave you. Thank you.